I am Heather Hamlin, Executive Director at Women Helping Women Fund, and today we are excited to have you join us for this Nonprofit Connect, highlighting a wonderful nonprofit in our community. Today I'm joined by Angie Newman, the Eastern Washington Program Supervisor for Safe Families and Children. Angie, hello. Thank you for joining hey. us today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, well, we would love for you to introduce yourself and talk about your role with Olive Crest. Yeah, well, like you said, I'm Angie Newman. I'm the program supervisor for Safe Families for Children here in Eastern Washington. And just so excited to be here and so, so thankful for the support of the Women Helping Women Fund. Oh, well, tell us a little bit about Olive Crest and your mission. I know that you are really um, dedicated to preventing child abuse, but we'd like to hear a little bit more about how you do that. Yeah, well, we're, we're dedicated to preventing child abuse by strengthening, equipping, and restoring children and families in crisis. Um, one life at a time, we like to say that's kind of our motto. Um, we like to say we would, uh, the vision is to have a strong family for every child, whatever that family looks like. So what are the various programs that Olive Crest utilizes to improve the lives of youth and families? Yeah, so uh, we have offices in Las Vegas, Southern California, Western Washington, and um, we are the actually only Olive Crest program here in Spokane, but uh, uh, company-wide, we have um, family preservation services, we have mental health services, we have foster care we have adopt, um, foster to adopt, and of course, safe families for children. So those are the variety of um, programs that we have throughout all of Crest. Wow, and so it's it's really a larger scale too, right? You have offices outside of Spokane in, what is it, Southern California? Where else do you have offices? Las Vegas, uh, Western Washington, um, and that's it. So I know Women Helping Women Fund, um, we did award a grant for the Safe Families for Children program Yay. last year, and it was such a great program. The work that you're doing, Angie, is incredible. Your passion comes through in every conversation. You know, I have a heart for foster care as well, and I think that this is such a wonderful twist on traditional foster care. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about your program um, and, and really how it works. Yeah, and Heather and I, you have talked about, you and I have talked about this. Um, so my family was a foster family for 12 years, and um, I just love the preventative side of Safe Families for Children. So we like to come alongside parents um, in crisis before CPS gets involved, before children are removed. Um, I guess I say before CPS gets involved lightly because actually a lot of our families are CPS involved, and CPS refers to us because they don't wanna remove the children and they know that we are a program that can come alongside and assist these families before it gets to that point. So um, we do this by hosting children and our um, highly screened volunteer host families for short periods of time, generally short periods of time um, while parents get through their crisis, whatever, call, uh, whatever had them call us in the first place, whatever they need to do. So that can be you know, a, a homeless single mother needing to find housing. And so she'll call us and we'll host her children um, until she finds a home. It can be a medical crisis. It can be, um, you know, a mother fleeing domestic violence and she needs a safe place for her children to go while she, um, you know, once again, to all of those things, finds housing and a job and things like that. And, and um, one of the things that I absolutely love is that we not only are hosting these children and our host families, um, but we are reaching out in relationship to mom. We are really trying to give mom that uncle aunt type feeling um, that she's probably never had in her life. We want her to feel supported and loved and encouraged. And so it's this relational thing that in the end, hopefully um, ends up with her having uh, these people that she can call in crisis now, this, the, you know, this person that she didn't have before. It, it's incredible because um, as mothers, right, we know that motherhood takes a village and oftentimes these are the people that don't have the village, right? They don't have that safety net. They don't have that person they can call. And I think that relationship is so unique what Olive Press provides. So uh, I guess a couple of questions. Um, do the biological parents maintain full custody 
while the children are with a host family? They do. It is volunteer on both ends. So they are, vol- they voluntarily call us and ask us to host their children. And we voluntarily say, absolutely. Yes, we will do so. So they maintain their parental rights. If at any time they, let's say that mom said she wanted a hosting to last two weeks long, but after five days, she's already found housing and she's ready for the kids to come back. They then return immediately to mom. And hopefully once again, that relationship, it's the beginning of a beautiful relationship. And what is the average length of stay? Yeah, so nationwide, it's 45 days, um, but it can vary. And we've seen such extremes here in Spokane. A lot of one or two night things, a lot of hostings that are just one or two nights, uh, a week or two. But we have had a hosting actually going on right now that's been over a year. And that is um, really dependent on the needs of the family, of the bio family, and also the availability of our host families, because our host families, some are available, you know, for that length of time, but a lot of them are not. So it really just depends on, on the needs of, of both and the, um, what they're able, excuse me, to offer. It's just such a unique model. It really is. Now, I know that um, your host families and all of Chris as a whole, you have that commitment to reunite the family as soon as possible. What is that rate of return or the reunification rate? Yeah, so last year, um, it was a 93.2%. And that's down a little bit from the 95% national average. And I do think that is because we have a better relationship with CPS. And so sometimes it really is that last chance and, and it might not work. And so there are there have been a couple of kids that have gone into care, but 93.2% is still real, real, real good. And we're really proud of that. Now, miss, I could be mistaken, but I believe that foster care reunification rates are more at that 50-50 kind of rates. Um, so 93%, that is, that is incredible. Right. It that is. really is. Yeah. Um, how have you seen this alternative to foster care really impact lives locally? Can you tell us a little bit? I mean, I think honestly, it's just less kids going into care, more families staying intact, um, hopefully with resources that they didn't have before. So um, that really is our goal is just that you know, child abuse prevention and less children going into foster care and ultimately those families staying together. That, that is the goal. Um, yeah. Now, I know you've told me a little bit about this young mother that um, you have worked with who has cystic fibrosis and it was such a powerful story. And I'm wondering if maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So um, single mom, um, eight month old baby girl, couch surfing, cystic fibrosis, and desperately needed a two-week hospitalization to get the medical care that she needed. Um, Very reluctant to do so because what's she going to do with this baby? She did not have a safe place. Um, So actually, hospital social worker reached out to us, and that is happening more and more, which is just so amazing to have that connection as well. Um, and, And gathered more information, and mom ended up calling us and We got to meet with her and uh, the host family that had said, yes, we would take in this little girl. And um, it it was just a beautiful thing. Um, Host mom, so so bio mom said, yes, let's do it, let's do it. And host family and uh, bio mom would FaceTime every night. And during this two week hosting, um, mom, bio mom and host mom, this relationship just, just developed. And so she's getting to see her baby girl on the screen and talk to her, but she also starts just really bonding with, with host mom and, um, you know, goal setting and, and sharing just really deep thing, you know, personal things. And it was beautiful. And they now have, um, an understanding that if mom needs to go back in, which she will, this is an ongoing thing that she's going to have to continue to do. Um, that this family will then step up and take that baby girl again. And, and they've continued to talk even after she's gone back and trying to find, you know, help find housing if they can and things. So it's just been a really, really beautiful connection. It's just, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. The, that safety net that you provide. Um, 
I mean, I think about our own lives, right? And, and who do we call when we need things? Um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about that safety net and, and what it's like for those families, maybe that this is the first time that they've ever had that? Yeah. And I think, I think you hit the nail on the head with, if, you know, we need to do clean a house, if we need to go on a date, if we, you know, if we have so many people that we can call, um, personally, my son, um, had brain surgery, emergent brain surgery, right after I started, um, with safe families for children. And it was like, it was so eye opening to me how many people I had that I could call to pick up kids, to help with groceries, to, you know, all of the things that I needed. And it was during that time that I, I mean, I, I can get emotional talking about it, but I realized who are these moms calling? I mean, what if this was, what if this was the single mom who didn't have the safety net? And it just really is a, an incredible, beautiful honor to be able to offer that to women who don't have it to be able to say, you know what, if you need a break, call me. If you need, I mean, to go get your hair done or whatever it is, the things that we take for granted and being able to call friends and family, it's just, like I said, it's an honor to be able to be there for them and offer that safety net that they they honestly have never had. Most of them have never had. I think it's a pretty beautiful thing. I would imagine that there are lots of community partnerships that are required when you are, are running a program like this. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about those partnerships? Yeah. Um, so our partnerships have grown leaps and bounds in the last few years. Um, and I, I, I think it's um, a lot to we pay a lot of credit to um, word of mouth and, and being trustworthy within this community. Um, because I mean, the call we we're in December of this year, we had like 30 hotline calls, which is just a record for us. So just people are calling and we're able to meet most of these needs. And so um, some of our community partners, um, Transitions, Vanessa Behan is one of our number one refers. Um, love Vanessa Behan. Um, CPS is referring to us quite often, um, Anna Ogden, uh, Catholic Charities. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. We are the hospital, the social workers at the hospitals now. We kind of talk, we talked about that briefly, but um, we, we couldn't do it without these community partners, these connections with the community partners, um, and just the relationship that we've, that has grown, the trust that has grown between us. That is so great. So what gets you the most excited about the work that you're doing? Um, I think it is people loving people, neighbors loving neighbors, and people coming together for the greater good. I think it is uh, so humbling to be part of that and to watch, um, you know, people come out of their comfort zone and go, you know, to a single mom's apartment that, you know, maybe is not desirable and to just be present with her and sit with her and hold her baby and, and just be part of, of something that they've never been a part of watching people be vulnerable. And, um, I don't know, just all, all of that. It's incredible. I just gave myself goosebumps. I just love what I do. And I love being part of this. 